So what does God do about the way we treat other people? When we diminish the humanity in other people, when we deny the precious image of God in them, how does the Lord respond? Look at verse 25. Therefore the Lord's anger burns against his people. His hand is raised and he strikes them down. The mountains shake and the dead bodies are like refuse in the streets. Burning anger, mountains shaking, bodies lying in the street like litter. Because God hates it. Hates it when we treat each other shamefully. When we're wise in our own eyes and, and judge other people unfairly. When we would deny justice to one another. And his anger brings a punishment that fits the crime. So they take all the land from each other. So he sends them into exile, away from the land. They feast while others are starving at the gates, so now they're going to be fed into the gaping moor of the underworld. And still his anger is not turned away, verse 25. Imagine angering God so much. The God of justice, who loves justice, who loves righteousness, looks at every act of injustice in his church with an implacable rage. And he will bring justice to bear. And he does it in the most unexpected way. He, he wields a mighty kingdom as his weapon of judgment. He whistles and they come, verse 26. They come swiftly and they are supernaturally sustained. Nobody in the army gets tired or stumbles. Not a strap of their sandals snaps. Their bows are drawn for, for action. Their horses are like battle tanks. This is a, an army as you've never seen it before. And the people who had been abundantly blessed by God, who had spurned him and taken what he'd not provided, corrupting justice and, and grasping for themselves things that were not theirs to take, would feel the full force of his justice. And this judgment in history, this very real judgment of God's people that came in the people of Assyria and then Babylon, is a picture of the fate that awaits all of us. The Bible wonderfully holds together two truths, as does chapter 5. God is a loving father who generously gives every good gift to his people. And that's a truth that, that the people of Judah have been presuming upon. We're God's people. We've got the temple. We do our sacrifices. So everything's OK. But God is also a terrifying judge who cannot abide sin. He hates it and must judge it. That's why the Bible repeatedly tells us that we ought to fear the Lord, even as we love him. We're to hold those two things together. And we should fear, shouldn't we? Because we're guilty. Even if we do believe in human rights, if we hate the idea of being racist or classist, there's no doubt that in the way that we have done church for, for hundreds of years, we've been shaped by the wider culture. The wider Anglican church culture, the wider uh, pagan society around us. Uh, we, just like Isaiah, can love God and be guilty of gross sin which offends him at the same time. And the question for us is, how do we respond to that? Well, first of all, let's remove the distortion glasses. Let's honestly look at ourselves. Have we treated all people in our church family, all of them, in the same way? If we don't, then we must acknowledge it, and we should fear God because of it. We've denied their humanity, we've denied the image of God in them. And secondly, we must repent. Repentance means, means turning around, not, not just seeing our sin and acknowledging, but hating it, turning from it, and going back the other way, walking with God more fully. And this, I think, is the grace of our passage. Grace because God doesn't leave us living in sin, which offends him so much. But, but he shakes us to wake us up. He, he tears the glasses from our face and says, look at this, repent of it. It's grace because as Christians, God gives us his spirit to enable us to, to see our faults for what they are and to to change as we grow to love Jesus more. And it's grace because he drives us again to cry out for a rescuer. Surely that's the place Isaiah wants us to reach at the end of chapter 5, to be desperate for forgiveness from the hand of God himself. 
he has perfectly prepared us for next week's passage. And if you can't wait, please do read ahead into chapter 6. And because God is gracious, we should rejoice, as Isaiah himself does at the very beginning of chapter 5, singing a glorious song to the one we love. My friends, can we commit together to see our corporate sins? Can we work to help each other to see our failures and to love all people equally? Can we look at each other as we begin to gather together again and see in each other the, the glorious image of God that he has put there? Let's go deeper than Black Lives Matter because we really do think that every life is precious and beautiful. And let us build a different community that celebrates our differences. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have made us in your image. Thank you that you delight to make us precious in your sight. And please, would we be precious in each other's sight? Would you help us to embrace one another across our differences? Would you help our church communities to be a place where it's safe to be different and where we celebrate the gifts and, and backgrounds and history of each other and where we raise up people and not on the basis of their class or, or their professional gifts but on the basis of godliness and the attitude that you've put within each one that we might truly be your people for Jesus' sake.